Welcome to the Bible Guy and to the continuation of our objection series to the Bible. Today we reach number seven. So we reach number seven of the co- most common objections to the Bible, your top ten. Today we have, you've already seen it, homosexuality. So homosexuality, a topic which is incredibly divisive, if not maybe the most divisive topic that you could have discussed in the last couple of years, certainly became more and more of a hot topic. And need I start by saying as Christians, when you meet this objection to the Bible, uh, we do have to enter the conversations with love, with compassion, as you would any other topic. I say this because it can become a very, very heated topic very, very easily when it seems like um, there is judgment involved. So it's a very common objection um, to why people will not accept the Bible because of its views on homosexuality. Now, the way I want to frame this video is centered around the most common, sort of the three most common um, ways of putting that objection across. So the three most common things that I hear um, towards Christians around the topic of homosexuality, and they'll all be answered pretty much biblically, be answering these common things that are said to Christians around this topic. <clears throat> the first one, the first thing that you often hear said is around homosexuality is, who are you to tell me that it's wrong? Who are you to tell anyone that it's wrong? Who are you to say? You've no doubt heard that objection. Who are you to say? Well, there's a pretty simple way of answering this. And it's simply to say that it's not us saying. It's God who says. It's the Bible that he, God has given us that says. It's not us. It wasn't me that came up with the rules around homosexuality, about its practice and those involved in it. I didn't come up with them rules. It wasn't me that said, I'm following God's word and it's God who says. So I don't have to take the flack for being the creator of them laws, the creator of them rules. So that, in a sense, frees Christians up because we take the flack for something that isn't really ours. It's not about agreeing at this point. It's about we're not the one to say we didn't lay down the rules. God is the one who said. In many, many scriptures, it is very clear. Leviticus 18, 22, uh, Leviticus 20, verse 13. There's obviously discussion in Genesis 19 about homosexual practice. And 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 talks about homosexuality. 1 Timothy 1, verse 10. Romans 1, 26 to 27 all are the main scriptures that talk about homosexuality. And they do make it very, very clear, I'll start from now, that it is something that is forbidden. Now, we'll clarify what I mean in a moment, but homosexuality is, being against it, is certainly God's idea. It's not ours. Um, We follow it, but it's not our invention. The other thing to say here is that Jesus did indeed what did support laws against homosexuality. Jesus was the one who said that he reaffirmed um, marriage as God's plan between a woman and a woman. And he also outlawed any sexual activity outside of that marriage relationship. Any activity sexually, whether it be heterosexual or homosexual, outside of a man and woman in a marriage relationship, in Jesus' eyes, was impure. So it's not about layers and what thing is more wrong than something else. That was Jesus confirmed about any sexual activity outside of that marriage relationship. So it's who are you to say? Well, it wasn't me to say. It is in God's word and God is the one who said. So that's how we would answer that. The second thing, so that's who are you to say. The second thing um, that's often put out there is, can I not love whoever I want to love? Should I not just be able to love whoever I want to? Um, this is where the clarification comes in about what the Bible actually says. Can I love whoever I want to love? Well, technically speaking, the Bible calls us to love, we're called to love all people, and we're called to deny ourselves to love people. What we often realize someone means there is a romantic love. They don't just mean love in and of itself, platonic love. They mean romantic love, and what they're very commonly talking about is a, a sexual relationship with that person. So they're not just technically talking about love but so we have to define what we're talking about here and this is the surprising bit for people so we've just clarified that the bible outlaws homosexual activity well it is very specifically outlawing homosexual activity if you look in first corinthians 6 uh, and in verse 9 it says 
Do not know the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders. If you look at all the scriptures on homosexuality, um, again, in one in Romans as well then, in Romans um, 1 verses 26 and 27, sorry, Romans 1, 26, 27, it says, Men commit indecent, indecent acts with other men and receive in themselves due penalty for the perversion. I mentioned 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 scriptures on homosexuality. If you look at all of them, they're all very clear. They all outlaw homosexual activity. They do not anywhere, the Bible nowhere outlaws homosexual attractions, feelings, same-sex attraction. And it's a very clear point that we need to make and not overstate what God's law state. God's law is very clear. It outlaws the physical activity, the physical homosexual activity, but it does not outlaw same-sex attraction. It doesn't outlaw having homosexual feelings. There's a difference between attractions and actions. We all have attractions that we shouldn't respond to. As a married man, in terms of other women, there's all attractions I shouldn't respond to. So there's a difference between having an attraction, having a same-sex attraction, and then physically acting upon that. And that's the Bible's very clear. It only outlaws and condemns the action. So what does this mean? As Christians, we can have sympathy for those who have same-sex attractions. We can, we can have sympathy. We can demonstrate love and grace towards them feelings. As we say, people do not wake up and ask to feel that way. Again, I don't wake up and ask to feel attracted to women I may see day to day. It may not be, it may be an unwanted feeling that I have. Them feelings can be there. The Bible does not condemn them feelings. It condemns acting upon them feelings. And that's really important. So that can I love whoever I want to love? We have to define what you mean by that. Obviously, the Bible calls us to love unconditionally. No one showed the love as much as Jesus did for all of mankind. But what are we actually talking about? We're talking about whether we act on the feelings that we have or not. The Bible is very clear. It condemns homosexual practice, but not necessarily the feelings. So that's to be clear on that one. The third thing to say then that often comes up is that as Christians, you're bigoted for imposing your views on others, for stopping other people from living the life they want to live. Again, a little bit like the first one, who are you to say? It's like, well, who are you to impose that view on other people? Um, again, that's what people often react to whenever the Christian starts to talk about, you know, what they believe and what they don't believe. Well, again, there's a, just to say a couple of clarifying things. First of all, there is a difference between disagreeing with someone's lifestyle and hatred. Just because I disagree with someone's lifestyle does not equate to hatred. There's many of my friends, colleagues, and relations over the years that I, my best friends, that we do not agree on everything and I do not agree with every aspect of their life. When I was a young man, my best friend um, got his very young girlfriend pregnant. I did not agree with all the things that he did, but we were still best friends. I still loved the guy and we still had a good friend, a really great friendship. So they're not equitable. It is possible to, to love someone. Um, but not agree with all the their life and their lifestyle. So that's just to be clear on that to begin with. But here's another point here though. As Christians, I believe we have to be willing to step up and preach God's word when we get the chance. We must stand for our convictions. We must be willing to not back down and car down when the topic comes up. Now, that's what we need to do. However, I believe, this is my conviction over time that has grown, I do not believe we are called to be legislators. As Christians, I do not believe there's a difference between church and the state now. The government, as we know in most countries, are not necessarily inherently Christian governments. So they're not out to implement God's laws in all spheres of life. So as Christians, we know that. We are to submit to the authorities and obey their rules where they don't conflict with God's laws. However, I don't believe as Christians that our goal is to go out and legislate for the country. So it's not up to us to go and set the laws and motions based on what we believe is right. I do not see that connection anymore between a clear church and state. So 
what that means is it's not my goal to go out and tell this country that I live in that they must not permit, again, gay marriage. Um, I don't agree with it personally, but it's not my goal to go out and legislate. I don't see that call. Um, again, that does not mean that we simply tolerate everything, uh, but it means that it's not our goal to go out and implement change. So that's the response to it's bigger to view, impose your views on others. I don't have to agree with you, but I'm not setting out to change the world. I want to call people to the gospel. And again, that's the key thing to say around this conversation. This is not the biggest topic. If someone wants to hold to the fact that Jesus lived and died, that he rose again from the dead, these are external minimal topics. These are, these are very almost irrelevant topics. The central key issues are the things we want to discuss, but certainly from time to time these things grow up. And we shouldn't really be surprised that the world does not follow our ways as Bible-believing Christians. It's not a shocker that they don't want to implement the laws that we do. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 tells us, it says, look, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. We let's not be shocked that the world does not want to implement the laws that God has put in place. As I say, we need to preach our, the word, share our convictions, but we are not called to be legislators of all God's laws on this land. The more they follow, the better, but that's not necessarily our call. So I hope some of that stuff helps us today. It's framed around the three things that you often hear. Who you to tell others how they should live? It's not us. It's God's plan, not ours. Um, we should be able to love who we want to love. Again, you got to define the distinction between having same-sex attraction and actually acting upon it and be clear on what the Bible condemns and what it doesn't. And the third thing is it's bigoted for views and you're imposing your views on others. We need to be willing to share, but I don't believe we're called to legislate for what the societal rules are. Hope that's helped us today. If it has, please hit the like and subscribe to that Bible guy. Please share this on for others. I know this is a hot topic. Please send me your thoughts on this. I appreciate hearing from anybody. Um, if you fancy um, signing up to help out on the ministry, um, you can look at the link on Patreon. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We'll be back again next week with the most common objection, number six. Let's get his word out there.